Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 14, part 3, Control of Blood Glucose Concentration. Now, we have done thermal regulation, which is the first thing. Second thing is what happens in the kidneys and osmoregulation. This third part is about control of blood glucose concentration. Now, I don't know if you know this, but it's very common knowledge that control of blood glucose is by insulin as well as glucagon and these two hormones are secreted in the pancreas now we are going to dive into that today in more detail but first of all we need to talk about what are endocrine and exocrine glands why do we need to know this now this is because pancreas acts as both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland so what is an endocrine gland? Endocrine gland are secretory cells which, which release secretions directly into blood capillaries in the glands. These secretions are usually hormones. Hormones can be protein-based or lipid-based. We will see later on. Now, for ex endocrine gland examples include pituitary glands, which we know um, the posterior one helps to secrete antidiuretic hormone, diuretic hormone, right, ADH, thyroid glands, adrenal glands, which are in charge of adrenaline, ovary, testis, and pancreas. These all secrete some sort of hormones. But these are endocrine glands. What are exocrine glands? Now, exocrine gl glands also are composed of secretory cells, but instead of releasing it directly into blood, this secretion is released into ducts or tubes and directed to a particular location. For example, um, your stomach would release secretions of enzymes into your stomach, right? Salivary glands would secrete those saliva in, into your mouth area, mouth cavity, and pancreas does that too in how and how and why and when we will see later on. But yep, this is endocrine glands, whereas these here are exocrine glands. Now let's focus a little bit more on endocrine glands and this secretion called hormones. Now you have heard this word flying around a lot. What are they exactly? Now they are secreted by endocrine glands and as I said, they can be protein or lipid. They can be globular proteins or steroids. For example, insulin which controls blood glucose concentrations is a protein hormone whereas steroid hormone example is testosterone as well as a lot of hormones secreted by the ovaries so there are two types now what are some of the characteristics of hormones we have known so far and if you don't know now you know now they are small molecules that are chemical messengers so they signal to other cells what is going on, right? It's needed in small quantities and it's secreted very quickly, but it's also broken down very quickly. It's usually transported in bloodstream by the endocrine glands to target cells. So those hormones will be able to be transported in blood, and then when it is when it is uh, when it meets a specific receptor on target cell, it can bind and then it can go on and stimulate a bunch of reactions. Now, um, don't forget that when we talk about receptors and hormones or chemical messengers in general, we are talking about the hormone binding to a receptor with a complementary shape. Now, these receptors can be on surface membrane or inside the cell. Now, these concepts are actually taught in chapter 4 so it's good to pause this video now and go and refresh your memory on the enzyme signaling cascade because that would really really help you in this chapter besides it's probably coming out for exam soon anyways as i was saying there are two types of hormones and therefore it's very natural that there are two sort of groups of receptors so receptors for protein hormones protein hormones uh, usually globular protein are water soluble and cannot pass through 
the plasma membrane. Now, if it cannot pass through, then the receptors must be then on the plasma membrane. So bind, complementary in shape, cause a signal transduction or a signal cascade, causes a response. Whereas, if the hormone is made out of steroid or lipid, it can then pass through the plasma membrane. So it makes sense for the receptors for steroid hormones to still be in the cytoplasm. So steroid hormone, you can see here, passes through the phospholipid bind layer, binds to a steroid receptor in the cytoplasm, which is complementary in shape, and then goes on to, well, it's not shown here, but goes on to cause a signaling processes, okay, and result in responses as well. Okay, so we have talked about exocrine and endocrine gland and what are hormones exactly. And if you remember just now, I mentioned that pancreas acts as both an endocrine and exocrine gland. And that's why we need to start with that. How does it act as an endo, uh, endocrine and exocrine gland exactly? So let's start with exocrine gland. Now, exocrine gland, um, it is an exocrine gland because it secretes pancreatic juice via the pancreatic duct into the duodenum you can see the duct cells here this is a duct okay and it goes through this channel okay pancreatic duct here into this area called duodenum and this is this contains enzymes needed for digestion so you do not need to know the details how does pancreas also act as an endocrine gland then now it's an endocrine gland because it also secretes hormones, not into the duodenum, but into the blood. Now, these secretory cells are called islets of Langerhans. Islets are like, the, uh, in English, it means small islands. So you can see they're like small groups of cells, like in circular in arrangement here. And if you zoom in further, you realize that they are composed of alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon, whereas beta cells in this little group here secrete insulin. So I think to myself, alpha has A, glucagon has A. So alpha secrete glucagon, beta secrete insulin. If we zoom in, we can take a closer look. So here is the islet of Langerhans. Here, connecting to it is actually a blood capillary. And you can see it is a group of cells composed of alpha cells and beta cells. Again, alpha cells secrete glucagon, whereas beta cells secrete insulin. Now, under a microscope, this is how it will look like. Okay, sometimes they will tell you, hey, hey, um, this is a transverse section of the pancreas. What is this? You can look at the area here that is slightly round. Yep, and tell them, hey, that's the islet of Langerhans. You can see also here the beta cell that zoom in is directly secreting those hormones into the blood vessel. Now this is the mark of an endocrine gland, secreting hormones directly into the bloodstream. Moving on to our favorite two hormones in this particular part, insulin versus glucagon. Now insulin again is a hormone, glucagon is a hormone, and they are secreted by the pancreas cells, right? Insulin secreted by beta cells, and glucagon secreted by alpha cells. Now, these two hormones are actually antagonistic hormones. They work antagonistically against each other. Now, this means that it's simply fancy words for th them working in opposite to each other. Glucagon, secreted by alpha cells, is used to increase, increase blood sugar, whereas insulin, secreted by beta cells, is used to decrease blood sugar. Now, for example, when you eat something, it's going to increase your blood sugar, right? So your beta cells will increase insulin to try and lower the blood sugar. It acts on your muscle cells, your liver cells, as well as fat cells or adipose cells. Now, when there is a decrease in blood sugar, okay, might be 
too much insulin or something or you have just exercise alpha cells will release glucagon which then breaks down glycogen to glucose or do some other things to increase the blood sugar so you can see that they work opposite to each other here's a graph that shows how they work opposite each other as well now you realize that this is a graph of blood glucose concentration against time okay and you can see this line would fluctuate around the set point this shows that negative feedback mechanism is in place and how insulin and glucagon actually affects the blood glucose concentration after meal time glucose concentration is going to increase therefore insulin is secreted causing the blood glucose concentration to drop and then glucagon is secreted because now it's too low increasing the blood glucose concentration so this goes on and on just a slight note that whenever you have a meal that level those levels fluctuate even more so you can see this peak is higher after the meal this peak is higher after the meal time as well it's quite an interesting graph you can take a closer look i don't know what you're doing right now while watching this video but i want to bet that half of you in front of the computer now are probably eating something okay so if you eat something your blood glucose levels are going to increase and that is a stimuli now the receptors that detect this are alpha and beta cells in the islet of langerhans of the pancreas as we just learned just now now what happens is that insulin will be secreted more to the blood so beta cells secrete more insulin to blood whereas the alpha cells will stop secreting glucagon insulin actually acts on liver cells muscle cells and adipose cells now this is important to know so what happens um, in liver cells muscle cells and adipose cells when insulin acts on them so what happens exactly so this is what happens first of all insulin which travels in the bloodstream finally reach the liver muscle and adipose cells it then binds the receptors on the cell surface membrane of their of, of their cells right this insulin um, is binding to receptor which have a complementary shape it is a very specific binding here anyways after binding you can assume there is some sort of signaling transduction that's happening some sort of signaling pathway which we don't need to know what we need to know is what it results in what is the response all this response go towards decreasing the blood glucose concentration so here's a list yeah you need to know all of these first of all it can increase the permeability of membrane to glucose so glucose is in a blood stream what you want to do to decrease the blood glucose concentration is to take it in to liver and muscle cells for that to happen there will need to be glucose transporter proteins at the cell surface membrane of liver and muscle cells because glucose is large it cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer right it does need some sort of transport protein so what insulin does is it triggers vesicles with glute proteins to move and fuse with the plasma membrane therefore there is more glute proteins at the membrane and more facilitated diffusion of glucose into cells can occur now what else can um, insulin do now insulin can cause an increase in glucose uptake or absorption from blood it also decreases the amount of glucose release into blood and this happens when an um, an enzyme called glucokinase is activated and it phosphorylates glucose now as we know glucose phosphorylation also is the first few steps of glycolysis glycolysis okay and therefore you can expect the rate of respiration to increase as well okay so glycolysis um, um, link reaction Krebs cycle oxidative phosphorylation all these processes will increase not only that when glucose is phosphorylated glucose are also trapped in cells so glucose cannot move out so there's increased glucose uptake less glucose release from the cells into the blood anyways what else can we do to 
decrease blood concentration, blood glucose concentration, well, we can make sure we convert those glucose into glycogen. So there'll be less glucose around. So glucose convert into glycogen. This is called glycogenesis. Glyco refers to glycogen, glycogen. Esis, genesis, which means um, creation or formation. So glycogenesis is formation of glycogen. Yeah. Now, how does this happen? There are two enzymes involved phosphofructokinase and glycogen synthase. Now, I recommend you just remember glycogen synthetase and you are set to go. What happens is this glycogen is a storage molecule in liver and muscles, right? And then when you need glucose again, you can hydrolyze it to form more glucose. Okay, what else can we do to decrease blood glucose concentration? We can increase protein and lipid synthesis use glucose and convert it to protein and lipid other than glycogen. Now this is possible and you don't need to know the details. All you need to know that is, is that it happens. What else? So now we are secreting insulin, right? Insulin actually also inhibits the secretion of glucagon from alpha cells. This is how glu alpha cells stop secreting glucagon. And um, whatever glucagon does will be inhibited. So for example, what glucagon does is to inhibit glycogen breakdown into glucose. And therefore, when you inhibit glucagon, you inhibit that as well. Glycogen breakdown is called glycogenolysis. So glycogen o lysis, so breaking down of glycogen. Other than that, there's also inhibiting this reaction. So inhibit the production of glucose from proteins and fats. Um, here, gluconeogenesis in, is inhibited. So production of glucose from fats and protein is called gluconeogenesis. Gluco refers to glucose. Neo means new. So new glucose formation from proteins and fats. Now, if you're confused with all these words, stick to the longer terms. Both are accepted. They're not essential. But you will see them in mark schemes definitely, yeah? Okay, all these things, uh, including rate of respiration increase and uptake of glucose, all these things result in a decrease in glucose concentration and returns the glucose concentration to the norm or the set point. Yeah, anyways, this is insulin. What happens when glucagon is present and secreted? Now, first off, you have to have a stimuli of some sort. This happens when you're exercising or whatever. But the stimuli is that the blood glucose level decreases. What receptors are involved is both alpha and beta cells, again, in the islet of Langerhans of the pancreas. But what really is secreting the hormone here is the alpha cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon into the blood, whereas beta cells is inhibited. They stop secreting insulin. Now, glucagon, unlike insulin, acts on liver cells only, so only the liver. And before we start the process, I just want you to know that if you have not revised chapter 4, Signaling Cascade, this is where you should pause the video and go and revise it because what we're going to learn in glucagon, how glucagon acts, is very, very similar to the one we learned in chapter 4, except with more terms. So here we go. Glucagon. So you can see here, the little signaling cascade pathway. The first thing that happens is glucagon binds to a receptor on a cell surface membrane. Glucagon is a protein hormone. Okay, it binds to a receptor on a cell surface membrane. This, re this receptor has complementary shape to glucagon. And what happens after binding is that receptor changes shape. And this change in shape actually activates G protein here which activates adenyl cyclase. So G protein, which is a peripheral protein near the membrane, is going to move, activate adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase, ASE, tells you that it's an enzyme. And what it does is that it produces cyclic AMP. Okay, the full name is cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Yeah. Anyways, 
CAMP is produced and acts as a second messenger. Okay, it needs ATP, it adds a second messenger, and what it does is it activates protein kinase. In this case, protein kinase A. And protein kinase will actually then phosphorylate other enzymes in the same signaling cascade to catalyze a series of enzyme control reactions. Okay, it triggers an enzyme cascade. So there's a lot of enzymes here involved that we don't need to know about. Uh, but what we need to know is that the signal is amplified. So what is the response in this negative feedback mechanism? Yeah? So after the enzyme cascade occurs, it signals a bunch of responses. And just to know, as we go through this list, keep in mind that glucagon always aims to increase the blood glucose level. Right? Increase. So the response would be like this, right? CMP will probably activate an enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase. And what it does it, is that it increases breakdown of glycogen to glucose in a process that is called glycogenolysis. So glycogen or lysis, breaking down of glycogen. Number five, um, which is just the procedure Sort of numbering, it could also use fatty acids and proteins as respiratory substrate instead of glucose. So, using these two things as respiratory substrate, hopefully, glucose is allowed to accumulate and therefore blood concentration will increase. There's also increased amount of production from glu of glucose from protein and fats in a process called gluconeogenesis, production of new glucose, so called. Now, as a result, all this glucose, okay, still in the cell, not in the bloodstream yet, can diffuse through blood proteins from the liver, so glucose transported proteins from the liver, into the blood, and therefore resulting in an increase in blood glucose concentration, and therefore returning it to norm or the set point. So this is it for glucagon. Um, now, we're just going to learn one more hormone, which is very similar to glucagon. And the name of that hormone is adrenaline. Now, the difference with glucagon and adrenaline is that adrenaline has also other um, sort of properties, right? It is called the fight or flight hormone. It's produced usually during exercise or stress. This is the thing that causes you to feel very hyped, um, increased rate of respiration, but heart beats faster especially during emergencies. Now, it's not secreted by the pancreas, it is secreted by the adrenal gland into blood. And essentially, it does very similar things to glucagon. It increases the glucose levels in blood. Okay, why? So, the muscles can undergo more aerobic or anaerobic respiration and produce more ATP, especially, as I said, in times of stress. So it makes sense that adrenaline has a very similar pathway to glucagon. Okay, so here you go. This is just a slide. Um, the, the, the pathway is really the same. Just substitute the word glucagon with epinephrine, which is another name for adrenaline. Okay, adrenaline and epinephrine is the same thing. So just replace the names and it's the same pathway. Binding to a receptor, activation of the G protein, which activates adenyl cyclase, which produces the second messenger, cyclic AMP, which then sets off an enzyme signaling cascade, as you can see here. If you would like to see an animated version of this signaling cascade and a little bit more about how hormones work at the receptor or inside the cytoplasm, you can click on this link right here um, in your slides and you should be able to see a little cute animation with classical music in the background. And with that, we are pretty much done with our third type of regulation, control of blood glucose concentration. But before we end this um, particular part, we do need to talk about one more thing, diabetes. When there is a high blood glucose concentration, I think you'll be thinking about diabetes. Now actually, this is for general knowledge, there are two types of diabetes. 
one is an inherited form type one it occurs during childhood because the body does not produce sufficient insulin now why does it produce sufficient insulin this might be due to autoimmunity towards its own b cell so your own immunity is attacking your b cells and therefore insulin is not produced enough and therefore you have high glucose concentration this requires insulin injection to regulate blood glucose so before a meal time a person who has diabetes type 1 will have to inject it into this area of their body so you will expect something like this diagram here so insulin is not produced by beta cells and therefore water glucose is not removed from bloodstream it cannot the glute is not open okay type 2 however occurs during adulthood because it's not that you are you inherited it it's because your body does not respond to insulin production at all why because prolong overproduction of insulin that means if you eat too many sweet things and there's constantly high glucose in your blood this leads to desensitization desensitization of the insulin receptors okay so your body does not respond to insulin anymore hence glucose is not removed from the bloodstream causing diabetes so there's a lot of insulin in the blood but the receptors are not working well and the only way to control this is really to control diet and lifestyle which caused it in the first place so more exercise less sugary foods so that's diabetes mellitus but um, regardless of which type actually the symptoms are the same in both forms there is high concentration of glucose in blood as well as in the urine interesting right so why is there a high, high glucose concentration that's because glucose are not taken up by cells less glucose is converted to glycogen or fat and not all of this glucose can be reabsorbed in the kidneys so it results in high glucose concentration in the urine as well now it's very interesting to note that high glucose concentration also causes a decrease in water potential of blood if you think about it if you have more glucose in the blood you have less water and um it's very very um common that water and salts will tend to move out of cell down the concentration gradient into the blood to compensate for this decrease in water potential this is by osmosis right and what that results in is not good for your body it's dehydration so your cells do not have enough water here the production of more dilute urine because you know water is lost from the cells and loss of salts actually causes a lot of cramps so numb or tingling hands or feet here now there's also um this decrease in water potential also is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus which make you feel like you're thirsty all the time even though you are drinking a lot of water already now because glucose is not taken up into cells and remain in the blood it is very often that cells use fat and proteins in respiration instead of glucose and this results in some sort of weight loss and um, there is side effects of this as well because as proteins are used in respiration especially there will be a build up of keto acid or ketones in the blood causing blood ph to lower and in severe cases this can cause coma now there are other symptoms as well in this diagram here like the idea of always being tired or always being hungry blurry vision frequent uni urination sexual problems vaginal infections um, all these things really affect a person with diabetes So how do we diagnose it in the first place, right? It's very common that a person who has diabetes 
or even if you go for a checkup, that they will do a urine analysis on you to see whether you have abnormal amount of glucose in your urine. Okay, so you collect the urine from test. Usually, um, you pee in a cup and they dip the stick into the cup. And from the colors and different tests here, you can see the presence of what? So presence of glucose and keto acids in the urine, which would be because not all glucose is resorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. This is covered last uh, video. Yeah. And maybe the person also has diabetes mellitus. Now, if there is long-term presence of proteins in the urine, not glucose, but proteins, this means that most protein molecules are not passing through the basement membrane at the Bowman's capsule. So something is wrong in the Bowman's capsule. Um, and the proteins are not properly reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. So this means that the person may have some sort of kidney infection or disease that's affecting the glomeruli, aka the blood capillaries at the Bowman's capsule. So different presence of different things allow us to diagnose people of different which have different diseases. Okay, this long-term presence also is associated with high blood pressure. This is because high blood pressure can affect blood vessels, capillaries, and the ultrafiltration at Bowman's capsule as well as reabsorption at the PCT. This is long-term presence of protein. So you have to test multiple times over a duration of time. If there is a short-term presence of proteins, don't worry. This is very common during high fever, vigorous exercise, or pregnancy. Okay, because proteins are used here. Anyways, back to the idea of a dipstick test. You pee in a cup, they dip the stick in. Now each little square here tests for something different. But what we're going to focus on is really how to measure glucose concentration. Now, please be aware that when you dip the stick into the urine, you are measuring the glucose concentration in the urine and not the blood. So this is a reflection of glucose concentration in the urine only. It is a specific test for glucose detection, so only for glucose, doesn't test for protein, doesn't test for other things, doesn't test for gluco, uh, keto acids and whatnot. Uh, just glucose. Now the reason being is that this dipstick test contains immobilized enzymes. How cool is that? So glucose oxidase and peroxidase are immobilized onto a pad on a dipstick. So one of these squares, all right? Just one of them. Dipstick is lowered into urine and this occurs. Glucose in the urine will be catalyzed by glucose oxidase to form gluconolactone and hydrogen peroxide. Now these are colorless things. But hydrogen peroxide can react with chromogen, okay, somewhere inside there, to, to form a darker compound. This is catalyzed by peroxidase. And this darker compound is visible to us. So we can compare the color of that square with a color chart. This is negative, which means there's no glucose. The darker the color is, the more the glucose present. The more glucose present, the darker the color. These reactions, yes, you do need to memorize. Now, as I said, that was to measure glucose concentration in the urine only, not the blood. How do you then measure the blood glucose level? which will be more accurate, right? More, more accurate. So we here have a biosensor. This is the ones that have at pharmacies. They prick your fingers, make you press it, put a drop of it on this little stick here. It is reusable. It is more precise. It also has the same enzyme that's immobilized on the pad. And let me tell you how it works, right? So glucose oxidase is immobilized on the pad. Okay, you place this small sample 
of blood on the pad okay not stick here it's called pad and insert it into the machine now this same reaction occurs so glucose converted to gluconolactone and hydrogen peroxide catalyzed by glucose oxidase but what's interesting is that when this reaction occurs a small electric current is generated at the same time this tiny electric current generated by this reaction is detected by the electrode this current is amplified and the reading is produced so there's a very small electric current and therefore you need to amplify it to measure it yeah anyways um, what results what number you see on the machine is that it's a numerical value so it's a number of blood glucose concentration not urine blood it should be quite accurate now the more glucose is present the greater the current generated and therefore you expect a greater reading from the biosensor all based on this little chemical reaction right here and with that we are done with this video we talked about endocrine exocrine glands what hormones are and what the receptors are at where the receptors are at the pancreas mostly and how insulin, glucagon, and adrenaline work. Last but not least, we talk about diabetes and how urine analysis works, as well as biosensors. So there is quite a lot of content here, uh, as you realize. Okay, quite a lot of content last video as well. And that's because this is actually a really big chapter. And there's a lot of questions that can come out from this chapter. So make sure you know all the details, okay? Anyways, we are at part 3. There is one more part. Homeostasis in plants. So again, a reminder, the textbook has this in chapter 14, but I'm only going to cover these things after chapter 15, lumping all the plant parts together. So that's it for chapter 14 for now. We'll finish it later on or maybe even next semester. See you guys. Bye!